If you want to turn to Hebrews 11, that's where I will be. Hopefully that's where you will be too. In the New Testament. Page 1524 if you have a Bible like mine. Some are amused by that, and I'm amused by that because I was sitting on festival, and the program that was playing was Dr. Scott, and he's obviously he perfected that saying. I'm not doing it because he said it. I'm saying it because you may have a Bible like mine. <laughs> I want to talk about something today, which at first blush will seem to have multiple dimensions to it, but. When I'm done, you'll see that there's really only one focus here. And we'll call this the focus or choice of faith. I'm specifically going to be focusing on the chapters, uh, chapter 11, the verses that deal with Moses. That would be from verse 23 in the 11th chapter through verse 28. And maybe not all of those verses, but that's the area that I'm going to be in. And <clears throat> Let me just say this. Moses belonged to a category of people chronicled by the writer of Hebrews that we've come to call the heroes of faith in this 11th chapter. I find it really fascinating. That those have been recorded in God's book. Moses rises, save for one or two instances in his life, he rises as a very noble character, obviously courageous lawgiver, or the conduit lawgiver, if you will, when they, hence they call it the Mosaic Law. But interestingly enough, if you look carefully, even though he was in that position as the receiver and distributor of the law, he was a man of faith. And this is why when the writer of Hebrews writes, by faith Moses. I think because we're so familiar with this passage and we refer to it as the heroes of faith, we tend to not think of the reality that this man, before there was a law uttered and the, we'll call it the sting or the echoes of Mount Sinai, there had to be an act of faith and there had to be something acting in that man's life before there was ever a law, which is a string that goes throughout Moses' life. Now, not part of my message, so forgive me, but I have to do this because I'm here and it just seems like the right time to say some brief commentary. I find it remarkable that in this 11th chapter, you've got the noble character of Moses, and immediately following the noble character of Moses, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, you come to, by faith, the harlot Rahab, perish not with them that believe not, when she had received the spies with peace. Let me just say a word about this because it's too good to pass up. Too much of Christianity today, in fact, most of Christendom through the ages, but I'm really seeing it specifically in the time we live in, classify people. Moses, who was of low birth, but rose to a noble and high position with great wisdom in the riches of Egypt. But look where he came from. He came from a slave hut. People tend to look at Moses and Moses as a type of people in the church, forgetting the part that I just said, that he came from a slave hut. And we have nothing chronicled of Moses, save of the time that he sees injustice occurring and kills a man. Other than that one act and the act that later gets him not being led into the promised land, we see Moses as a good and noble character within these pages. Too much of Christendom today focuses on this idea that everyone 
in the body is of good and noble character. And if there are whores like Rahab that were saved by faith, somehow to today's society, it's a gross injustice to put the two side by side. But the reality is the writer of Hebrews, who was writing to a community who knew the Old Testament, didn't have a problem with it. It's God-inspired, spirit-inspired writing. Just a little reminder for those people who get into the mindset that somehow they think, and whether it's your priest, your pastor, somebody who is in a religious position or a spiritual position, there are not even Moses. We only have good chronicled, save the two things I mentioned of his character and an act that he did. There are no noble, good people. There are only sinners. That's all that we all are. And anyone who seeks to highlight and focus on the Rahabs because she was such a lowly person and a person of ill repute, basically defecates on what God has set out as God sees no difference between the distinction that one might make of the noble character of Moses and the ill repute of Rahab. He sees it all the same way. And if you or I decide to see it any other way, you basically mock God and his sovereignty about who he saves and how he saves people. That's just a sidebar because it's so delicious. It's right there. And I thought, how can I pass that by? It's a message before the message that says if you came in here today and you feel like people have been telling you you are a second-class citizen, you shouldn't be allowed to worship or you shouldn't be a part of, pay close attention. It's coming. My late husband had some really good words. One of those good words was, and some of you may, may remember the history of how, watch for it, the word pluck, as in plucking you, <laughs> came to be. And if you don't know that history and what it pertains to, please go look it up. It's on the internet. I didn't make this up. And this is one time where you find abundant witnesses to this story. But, but he used to use that kind uh, phrase to um, you know, express his gratitude towards certain things. <laughs> so if you don't like it, you can you know, go find a you to pluck. <laughs> God is God. He decides. Once we all remember that, there ain't going to be any categories of who's saved and who's not, or who's, who's in and who's not, or who's a recipient of grace. Just saying. Back to the book here. So we have the character of Moses, and it begins in, in detail, kind of interesting. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. You'll read in the book of Acts, as well as in Exodus, this translation of proper child. Actually, he was a beautiful child. And the word is something that is quite significant. When Pharaoh's daughter saw Moses, and she saw that some translations say he was a goodly child, no, he was a beautiful child. He was beautiful to look at. There was something so, and I happen to think it was the grace of God that she was attracted to without knowing it, a child of light, if you will. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Now, you know the history, the backstory to this, but the parents of Moses, sometimes I think when we can read past that story very quickly and fail to recognize that these people were of great faith as well, not mentioned here because Moses is the focal point, but they were parents of great faith because the decree had been issued for children of a certain age from these Hebrew children to be massacred, male children. This child is put into a, a little small ark, floated down the Nile, and 
Moses' sister is keeping watch, there's another act of faith. I don't necessarily think she was keeping watch, thinking where is the basket going to go necessarily. They sent it in the direction where Pharaoh's daughter was bathing. I think all of these are incredible acts of faith to say let's, let's do this and let's see what God will do. These were people of faith. And even though this is not part of our biblical record, I refuse to believe that they just randomly thought, let's put the kid in a basket. You know, at least if they find him, they find him. If they kill him, they kill him. I don't think that was the thought. Because obviously, when Pharaoh's daughter plucks the child out of the water, Miriam conveniently says, would you like me to go fetch someone and nurse the child? Just happen to have somebody in mind, right? So convenient. So I think all of this was acts of faith. And then, of course, by faith, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And I want to talk about that for a minute because the record shows when he was come to years, sometimes people get confused about this, reading the record of Exodus and reading what Stephen's sermon declares in the book of Acts in the seventh chapter. But it's pretty clear that he had to be 40 years old when it says when he was come to years. He was 40 years old. That was, that was the time. So I want to make a first point here. And the first point is that, yes, Jehoshabed nursed him, and I'm sure that had, they just, had she just nursed the child until the age of what we would call weaning, the child would probably have no memory or very little memory of the things of God. So I'm not saying that Jehoshaphat had access to Moses until he was 40. I'm not suggesting that, but I think there might have been an overlap of time long enough for the child to come to certain, a certain knowledge about the God that he would eventually serve. His parents did indeed serve. What's equally interesting about this is coming from a slave hut, being taken out of the water, living most of his life in the riches and wisdom of Egypt, and getting to about the age of 40, where he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So let me make a first point here, because all of these will culminate in some way, shape, or form to a bigger lesson that has application to all of us. When I think about God's sovereignty in my life, I've often publicly lamented to you and said, why didn't God bring me sooner? Because it wasn't time. And I want you to notice something. In case you are like me, where you say, you wish you would have known sooner, Moses had to reach the age of 40 and spent essentially, I don't know, we can't even say what years his mother had influence, but we know that he was minimally well, let's just say safely 39 and a half, somewhere around there, I don't know, maybe more, whatever the age of the child was, that they, they put the child into the ark, and it says I'm just kind of glossing over it. But my point is that all of those years were spent immersed in Egypt, in the luxury, in the splendor, in the wisdom, in its educational process, all surrounding Moses. So it's safe to say that even though Jehoshaphat may have shared about the living God, this is all he ever knew until he was 40. So for those of you listening to me that say, I wish I would have known, Egypt is also often compared to the world, sometimes compared to sin or being out in the world. Many times the Bible refers to Egypt that way as in bondage to the world or being in bondage to sin. So for anyone who's listening to me, who says, I wish I would have known sooner, like I used to do a lot, and I sometimes still do, recognize that even somebody chronicled in God's book had to be steeped in the world for 40 years before he was delivered out of it. Kind of interesting, because you don't, usually don't think about things like that, at least I don't. But the other thing is it says he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And I think there is 
Something interesting about this, refusing to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, means that Moses gave up a lot of things. It may not seem like much to you, because in this short phrase it says he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, but I think it's quite clear that had he remained in his post and stayed the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he would have become the next Pharaoh of Egypt. He would have become ruler of that universe as we have it recorded in ancient history. But rather, he refused that. And the refusal of that also means that he refused riches, the riches that came with that life, honor, notoriety, prominence, however you want to put it, that came with that life. And the next verse tells you all you need to know, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. And we need to talk about this because I think a lot of times when people talk about choosing by faith, especially if you're familiar with this chapter, you can limit this to the people who are mentioned in this chapter and never recognize that the same choices are afforded to you and to me during our lifetime here on earth to choose by faith versus to choose by sight. To choose rather to participate in something that maybe, if you think about it, what Moses left, prestige, as I said, honor, the dignity, a certainly a large rulership, some form, and I'm certain to say he would have become the next pharaoh, leaves all that choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. And we know about these people of God, these children of Israel. What are they known for? Complaining. <laughs> what are they known for? Not listening to God. What are they known for? Lack of faith. What are they known for? If you just keep read the chronicle of the Pentateuch, specifically from the time of the Exodus, Oh, they were already ready to blame him before the exodus occurred for other things, but throughout and then into the wilderness. And it was their grumbling and their mindset that made that journey, which shouldn't have been very long to the promised land, a very long, long, long journey. If you think about it, we know how long, if we know the territory and the geography, you could calculate approximately how long it should have taken versus the 40 years that it did, and most didn't make it in. Not because they couldn't make it in, because God had enough and for the most part drew their bones in the wilderness. So the choice that Moses made was to associate with a bunch of grumbling, stinky, low life, no honor. We're not talking about, well, these are the people of God. We're talking about what he chose to leave behind to associate with. We all, in our lifetime, will make that similar choice. It's not as cut and dry as you think. But I bet if I asked here, how many of you made a decision, you were going to walk this pathway, this faith of yours, to the absolute opposition of your friends or family. Show me your hands. You chose by faith. This is the part that should be someone encouraging to you, not discouraging. Because you know, most people say, oh, your family, they didn't like that. They weren't with you. They didn't encourage you. But the reality is even Jesus' family didn't encourage him. They thought he was crazy. So don't think that it's something unique to you. And I think all of you who raised your hand and those in the sound of my voice, those people who have vehemently expressed, what, are you out of your mind and why are you doing this, would paint you as someone who has lost their faculties, who has lost their reason to properly process what you are engaging in. But I ask you the question, do you think that Moses, being grilled by some friends or family, but not, not so much the family part because they knew by faith, but would say, what are you, 
crazy. Maybe Moses' association within the palace. He had some trusted advisors and some trusted servants, and they said, Are you, have you lost your marbles? You're going to leave all of this to go out to that? Yep. And you notice something. This is what's interesting. We will all make a choice eventually. It's not a choice, as the evangelist would like to tell you, of accepting Christ. Because Christ accepted you. He, he bought and paid for the whole world, whether you accept it, like it, acknowledge it or not, period. doesn't mean all are saved. It just means that that's what happened at Calvary. However, the interesting part to this is we all will make a choice. Do we listen to the people around us? Some are of a different religious upbringing and are vehemently opposed to you taking it. And it's, it's usually rooted in ignorance, by the way. I hate to tell you that, but I'm sure most of you know. It's usually rooted in ignorance to hinder someone because the mindset is you were born into this particular denomination and this is the true religion. This is the only way. But the problem with that is a lot of those folks don't even know the Bible. They're calling their faith a true religion. But to me, to come to know anything about God, you've got to be reading this book. It's not something that you just feel and you say, I feel God. You may feel God later in life. You may feel God after you've come to know who God is. But you can't operate on this I feel stuff. You come, across, you come across that individual saying, I feel I don't need to know or I don't know much is actually not very smart when it comes to the things of God. So I can just imagine those trusted ones talking to Moses and saying, well, you realize what you're doing? Do you realize what you're giving up? Now, let's put it in today's terms and try and see if we can make some of these things apply to us. The price of associating, and I know this sounds terrible because in today's climate everybody's so politically correct, but the price of associating, and we're not talking about fringe groups or things that are right on the cusp of something. We're talking about anyone can go and look and read this particular book and shades of interpretations will arise. But if you focus on all the shades too much, you'll lose sight of the main focal point, which is Christ. Christ, who came in the flesh, who died for us, who died for our sins, he rose, he's coming back. Lose sight of that. You've now just gotten involved in the nuances of religion, which won't save a squirrel. So think about it. People get involved. And let's just now specifically say about this church. Not knowing that maybe your friends or your family will say, well, you know, you're leaving the faith that you grew up in because they don't know any better because the faith that they're describing is simply a building, an entity under the guise perhaps of Christianity, under the guise of Christendom. You're leaving this for that? Don't forget where I am with Moses. You're leaving this for that? And what does it say about Moses choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season? Don't think the pleasures of sin for a season may strictly be reduced down to a set of activities, but rather in this case, let's just say anything that would be the opposite of trusting or fading God and his promises. That's a much easier way to explain this. It's much easier to go out into the world, stay in the world, be in the world, operate according to the principles of the world, where you have comfort, even though you don't. It's false comfort. Than it is to, by faith, choose to walk by faith and to not be able to actually see except to read and to know and to pray and to try to understand the mind of God. Much easier for people in your circle and in mine to say, but it's, it's much better. Why would you leave that for this? I think I was having discussion with somebody, can't remember who, might have been you saying something earlier this week in a meeting about some religious leaders back in the 80s and 90s that were 
wanting to give up their was you wanting to give up their positions as people of God to go and run for government. And Dr. Scott used to say that's a step down, that's not a step up. It's a step down. But to the circle around, they'd say, they would say, go and do that. You'll have influence on the world. But the world is not influenced. The only thing that has happened in the last many years is the world influencing the church, which is why so many people cannot distinguish between what the church is actually for and its purpose versus what the world has grafted on as the purpose that they have deemed, they have decided that this is what the church should do, not what God said it was built for, for Christ. To bring men and women to the knowledge of the perfect man till we all come to the unity of the faith not to the new entertainment center or to the new rock concert or to the new mosh pit in the name of Jesus and whatever else is going on. So he chose this. You all have a choice. I could go back in time and say, by faith, you old timers, you chose by faith to trust God concerning the future of this ministry. You chose by faith, not by sight, you chose. You did a choosing by faith, you did. Versus those that operated strictly in the seen and in the known and in the flesh and in the world and chose not to. And I'm sure if you step back a little bit, you can begin to see God has given you over the course of your lifetime many opportunities to choose by faith. It may be making that leap of faith with an individual to two people to get married or to have a child or whatever it is. God gives those opportunities that then you almost have to look at Moses and say, this is what he chose. He gave up a lot. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than the riches, greater than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Let's talk about that. So let's talk about first the fact that when God called him to leave, and God didn't say, Moses, you leave. He fled. He fled under the guise of fleeing for his life. Why? Because it was known then that he had killed a man, and if this circulated amongst the people and got up to the higher ranks of potentially Pharaoh, Fear came. He fled. Spent 40 years in the desert. And when God finally did talk to him at the burning bush and was very specific, come here, Moses. Yes, you, Moses, not, not that other guy that's 40 miles away. You. And being able for us to read every part of Moses' life there is some dimension that we can relate to. God specifically called you, not perhaps audibly, but he calls people to places that don't make sense on paper. Think about this. 40 years in the desert and 40 years looking at donkey butt, <laughs> sand, the occasional whatever that might pass by once, every year, maybe, 40 years. And then God says, you, come here and take your shoes off. The place where you're standing is hollow. Take your shoes off and approach and begins to, ha to talk to Moses and give him instruction. So now we could easily say God waited until Moses Spirit was right. God knows the time we don't. But whatever that is, let's bring this again back to where we are. And responding to the call of God in the strangest of places and being alert to choose by faith and not say, oh, the, the world would say, I'm a lunatic. The world would say, that's not how things happen, but this is how God says it happens. 
He finds us where we are. He deals with us. He knows all about you and he knows all about me and yet he still deals with us just like this, although I haven't had an experience of a tree that burned that wasn't consumed or the voice of God speaking to me, but I can tell you, looking back, that there was a choice by faith. Something tugging at me which I, wasn't, I couldn't explain or define or make sense of. And to people around me, they might have said, that's crazy. You're going to go to church? Maybe something's wrong with you. I, I mean, you know, I'm sure people have said this to you too. Is there something wrong with you? And you go to church every Sunday? <laughs> yeah. What about on important days like the Super Bowl? <laughs> yeah, I'm there. So it's, it's just kind of like that. And you can kind of begin to see that even though I'm doing this lightly because I want us to make an application, and it says Moses forsook Egypt. It's interesting that then God says, okay, now I'm going to send you back to Egypt and I'm going to give you a commission. And we see Moses march right into Pharaoh's court and say, let my people go. How interesting is that, that God would sometimes use the very place he's delivered us from and send us right back there to do something for him. And because we're so familiar with this Exodus story, you can lose the ability to take something for yourself and recognize that God, your whole life, the moment you have chosen by faith, God will keep bringing opportunities for you to choose by faith. Things that the world say, it doesn't make sense. Do you even understand what you're doing now? That doesn't make sense. Now, I'm not talking about being foolish, but I am talking about choosing by faith. And when I talk about this, there are several factors that I want to kind of hammer on so that we can kind of bring this all together and make some clarity out of a point that I want to drive home. The whole point of the children of Israel, starting with the parents of Moses, it was from before their time and passed on to them an expected deliverer. It was the promise given to Abraham that his people, his descendants, would go into a land where they would become slaves and in the fourth generation they would come out. That promise had to be recited and retold and retold and retold until the time of Jehoshaphat and Amram, the parents of Moses, an expected deliverer in the most unexpected person. If you, please, I mean, know how familiar it is, so it's hard to kind of shake the familiarity, but I ask you to try and do this to see even God's way of doing things to choose by faith is so radical Somebody would say, well, that's not a good deliverer. A good deliverer means that he was part of the Hebrew home and stayed in the Hebrew home and never experienced Egypt because if he experienced Egypt, it means he was a contaminated man in the eyes of the Hebrews. He was a contaminated man that could never have the power or even be the deliverer because of his years in Egypt. And yet God said, this is the one I'm going to use. So profound. This is the way God has done this through the ages. It is not, and I'm going to just reiterate this, it is not because someone has been educated in the world or that they receive a degree or a diploma that qualifies them for ministry. It is what God does that qualifies them for ministry, which no human being can take of themselves. God has to give it to the individual. And when, when God does choose an individual for that purpose, you've got a pattern right here, unless, unless we're not reading the same book. Here is a man who came from a slave hut, from slave parents, not from riches. He didn't go to any famous Hebrew school. He didn't sit at the feet of what would have been the equivalent of an earlier Gamaliel. He didn't have any of that. What he had was an education of the greatest kind the world had seen or known in Egypt. 
which, by the way, doesn't necessarily mean that he was well-schooled on things like astrology, even though they had people whose whole profession in Egypt was to focus on the stars and the science in the sky. Doesn't mean that Moses was well acquainted with that knowledge or even schooled in it. When we talk about the wisdom of Egypt, we're referring to something that in our frame we could easily say the wisdom of the world, which Paul picks up in Corinthians and says the wisdom of the world essentially amounts to nothing. Not that it's, it's going to be bad or good, but in the eyes of God it amounts to nothing. Unless it's going to be used in a method where God will use that wisdom which then comes from him, by the way. But I think it's interesting that just looking at this, God chose this vessel. And this vessel didn't have 40 years on the backside of the desert. Maybe God spoke to him. Maybe God schooled him. I don't know, but he did not have, there was no written word as we know it, that he could sit there for 40 years and on his little stump looking at donkey butt, sitting there reading and quoting chapter and verse and making some, you know, commentary in his brain because maybe, or he, it didn't happen. And then to be told, you, Moses, are going to go and deliver the people, my people, you're going to go, first he says they're going to be your people, but they're my people, you're going to go deliver them. Moses could have said, God, Hell no. <laughs> Take somebody else in the backside of the desert. I'm sure you got other choices. And God's like, no. Go. By faith, Moses went. By faith, which seems, I want you to really think about this, seems absolutely banal that one man would go in front of Pharaoh, knowing the power of Pharaoh, knowing the riches of Pharaoh, knowing the army of Pharaoh, one man would go. But he chose by faith, not what on paper would say, oh boy, yeah, that's not really a smart move. Chose by faith to listen to God's word and to go. And what's the first thing that happens? And you realize something very incredible. Moses is not afraid of Pharaoh. You remember he fled Egypt fearing for his life. He walks into Pharaoh's court and whether it was another pharaoh or not, the name would have still been on the people's lips somehow about this man who left Egypt to go and be with the slaves or in the desert. He's not afraid. This is why the New Testament says, be not afraid of them that can hurt the body. Be afraid of him that can kill the soul. And as long as faith is operating, and as long as faith is operating, not faith based in faith, but faith in God's word that says, God declare this thing and I will choose by faith, you're going to be okay. It doesn't mean that the road's going to be easy. Look at Moses. It wasn't easy for Moses. You can say, well, but God gave Moses Aaron and Miriam. Well, that wasn't easy. If you know their story, that was a real pain for Moses probably, even though he said, I, I can't speak and I can't talk. Okay. Your brother will go with you and he can speak. And after a while, I'm sure Moses probably regretted ever saying that. Like, could you shut this guy up? He's just, and make some of the worst blunders and the worst sins that are done at his organizational skills while Moses is absent. You know, watch, watch the fort while I go up and talk to God. Creates a disaster. But Moses chose to go, and not with fear. And I'm asking some of you today who have made the choice of faith and to walk by faith, to be much like-minded in Moses, how we have the telling of his by faith, by faith, by faith, because our whole life is predicated, our whole life has these built-in situations that we have to choose. There is no autopilot in your lifetime. And if you're on autopilot, you're probably like in one of those self-driving cars that hasn't been perfected yet. So just <laughs> let's leave autopilot alone for right now because you know what happens potentially with that. But 
you're going to have to make choices. Now, as I said, Moses was a noble character. Elsewhere, he's called meek, which is not milk toast. He was under God's control for the most part until the people ticked him off when God said, speak to the rock, and he struck it. And that act cost him, in the record of the Old Testament, getting into the promised land. We know in the New Testament when it says they wrestled over his body and he appears on the Mount of Transfiguration, we know that there's more to the story than just what the Old Testament tells us, that God was saying, I'm not finished with my servant Moses, who did much good in his lifetime to put up with these people, but more importantly, he chose by faith. He chose, I'm going to say it as if God is looking down, he chose me over that. He chose me over them. He chose me when it didn't even make sense. Then you come into the New Testament and you hear Christ say to someone who asks him, what is the greatest commandment? And after he says to love your neighbor as yourself, and then immediately we're confronted with this picking up and denying business, which people don't want to hear about anymore because that's just so archaic. But essentially, if you prefer anything over me, Christ is talking. You cannot be my disciple, my learner. God has been saying the same thing. Choose me by faith. Choose me. The critics you'll always have around you. This is another reason why Jesus said, be careful of the leaven of the Pharisees. Why do you think he said that? Because he knew what was in these men, their, their profession of faith, which was worn and visual in robes and in great pomp and regalia, to the onlooking eye, they'd say, that's a holy man. But he said, inside full of dead men's bones, whited sepulchers, beware of the leaven of Pharisees. And why use the word leaven? Because leaven spreads out a little, a little bit, and it can expand to a whole lot. By faith, Moses chose. I'm asking you as a congregation standing in this situation today, which you may say, well, is there, is there an undercurrent of this? Yes, there is. How many times in the course of your walk that you've been walking with the Lord, that you've been following along, that people have said, and you prefer doing this over that, or you prefer being here over being there, you have some preference that is not like mine, what's wrong with you? Think about, and there's a whole category of people here by faith, they chose by faith. But Moses, by faith, who probably, out of all these, we, t we can talk about the earlier chronicle of, for example, Noah, or even Enoch, these who were by faith, Enoch walked with God as, as opposed to preferring to walk out in the world or walk out with others. By faith, Noah, when God said, build an ark, and there had never been such a thing as the deluge that was brought upon the face of the earth, but by faith, he chose to listen to God. But none of these, even the descendants, when we talk about Jacob, we could, Isaac, Jacob, we could talk about these, but none of these gave up like Moses gave up when we talk about what he stepped, essentially, in the eyes of the world, what he stepped down from to follow God and to choose by faith. None of these other people chronicled here had made that type of jump. Somebody says, well, are you trying to say that people out there, if they want to follow God, they have to do that? No, what I'm telling you is it's a choice by faith. Go to the New Testament. I'm sorry, but I jumped back and forth because you can hardly preach this message without confronting old and new. Christ said, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Were they fishers of men while they followed him then and there? No, but they later became that. But the, the call was, follow me. And it says, straightway, they forsook their nets and they followed. By faith, these men chose. By faith, they chose to follow Christ. There wasn't any guarantee when Christ said words that were maybe great teachings at the time, and they said, Rabbi, 
But when he said, follow me, they chose by faith. I'm saying to you, don't do as I do. There's too many people out there that say, well, you know, follow somebody and do what they do. I'm not telling you to do what I do. I'm telling you to choose by faith. And for the one who understands what that means, there are some hard decisions that come your way. The flip side of your decisions is what God is seeing. I just said about Moses. I'm speaking as though God would be chronicling the life of Moses and saying, he chose me over the riches of Egypt. He chose me over becoming king of that kingdom. He chose me over the privilege and the honor. He chose me, God's still speaking. I wonder what, what it will be like when all of our lives, from, this, from just this day forward, not necessarily 20 years past, 10 years past, five years, from this day forward, what will be chronicled of our lives every time an opportunity comes and the same God that speaks of Moses and says, he chose me by faith. Don't think Moses disappears somewhere at the close of the New Testament gospel records because it says in the book of Revelation, they overcame, but they're talking about Moses and the Lamb in the same verse, as if to say God is still talking about his servant Moses that by faith he chose. These are the choices that confront each and every one of us in a diversity of ways. Start first with your individual life, and I tell you, I don't meddle with your life. I don't tell you what you, what you should do and what you shouldn't do. I tell you, these are the pieces of information I'm giving you from the Bible. And I try to make them, they're applicable to us. They're not just Bible stories, like Sunday school stories. We'll read them in a little box. We close the box, and we're done. Everything in here should be designed to make us do a little thinking, a little meditating, a little prayer, some soul searching that asks the questions that maybe gets us back to talking with God, that we are looking at our faith, not examining anything except whether we be in the faith and acting in faith, and then when the opportunities come, to choose by faith. As I said, and I digress to this, as I said, some of you, chose by faith what to two or three times the number of people in this sanctuary chose not to do. You made a choice by faith. Dr. Scott said, Pastor Scott's going to be the next pastor. If something happens to me, you heard him say it, you chose by faith to stay by the stuff. And I've said many times, people are free to leave. Go find somewhere else where you can find whatever it is you're looking for. This is not a cult. Go and live your best life out there. <laughs> and just go. Leave, leave me to do what I'm called to do. And leave those who have chosen by faith to do what they were called to do. But for the ones who have made the choice and chosen by faith, there's a whole series of these choices. I'm using that because it's the obvious one. But your whole life is a series of that. My whole life is a series of that. And ultimately, when we think maybe we haven't seized all the opportunities, I, I'm telling you, I know for sure I haven't seized all the opportunities. Many of them have passed me by because I just either wasn't paying attention, I wasn't looking. Now I'm alert. I'm I'm. I'm awake. I'm looking for the opportunities. I'm thanking God when they arise from the smallest things, as I said, which are not small but quite great, to be able to pray for somebody. It doesn't mean you go out and you accost somebody in the street and you start praying for them. We're talking about what Paul said first to the household of God, and the people you know, and the people that are part of the body. I'm not saying don't pray for people out there. I'm just saying that's a starting point. There's an opportunity and a, a choosing by faith right there. There is a choosing by faith when it comes to somebody saying, I, I would like to be used of God. Be careful, those are big words. I'd like God to do something with me. Look out, if you really mean it, God will. 
and it may not be what you think it ought to be. Remember the message of clay in the potter's hands. Don't think when you say, use me, God, and I want to be a little teapot, that <laughs> God's going to not put you down on the wheel and turn you into something that definitely doesn't look anything like a teapot. <laughs> follow me, I'll make you something you're not. And I'm not telling you to follow me. I'm using this out of a message I delivered on Christ's words. I think except we come to that reality of choosing by faith, the church will stay constantly muddled in a state of, I need to see where this is all going. You ever hear people say that? I need to see where this is all going before I decide. Did Moses say, I need to see where this is going before I decide? Amen. If we go back to Rahab, did Rahab say, you know, I'm going to see where this goes before I hang that cord out the window. <laughs> did she do that? Yeah. Only we engage in this type of insanity. Let me see where this, I need to see where this is going to go before I make a decision. Why? Because that decision is based on eyes that are eyes, sight, seeing, and not faith. When you keep recognizing Every single day there will be faith opportunities and times for you to choose by faith and not say, let me, let me see where this thing goes. This is not, oh, get out there and engage in foolishness and craziness. I do make a distinction between faith and foolishness, but I do recognize the opportunities that abound. May God help us today from this day forward as a congregation to be able to see those opportunities and to be able to choose those by faith rather than to say, I'm going to wait, I need to know, I need to have proof. Nothing of that statement is choosing by faith. That's choosing the flesh way that says, I am, I'm, going to, I'm going to see how this goes, and then, I'll, then I'll, get, I'll, I'll, you know, if it's the winning team, I'll jump in. Oh, I, I was on that team to begin with, don't you know that? You know what God does with those people? They're in the middle. They're the lukewarm people. Revelation tells you what God does with people that are right there in the middle. They're never hot. They're never cold. It says he spews them out, out of his mouth. Now, I don't want to be in that position, and I'd prefer people to be either hot or cold. You either are choosing by faith or not. But you have an opportunity starting today, and I'm asking you as a congregation to kind of go back and reread the passage and reread Moses' life, not necessarily from the time his parents placed him in the ark, but the events that incur, that happen from the time that just before he leaves Egypt. And you recognize that none of these choices at the beginning and on paper or just from this book make any sense. And particularly the one where God says, and go back and you talk to Pharaoh. That makes no sense at all. You go back to the place I delivered you from when you fled. You go back there and you tell Pharaoh. And, and it, it'll be your mouth. Maybe Aaron will help you. And, I'll, and I'll, give you, I'll give you a few signs. In today's climate, if somebody said, I've been sent by God, you hear that all the time. People toss that around. I'm, I was sent by God. God gave me a message. God, you remember that? God gave me a message to tell you. I'm not, ta I'm not saying me, but some brother or sister that comes to you and says, God told me to tell you. And you know what you're supposed to tell those people? Seeing that they're in so good with God, you need to tell them to tell God that you're available and God can come tell you directly. Seeing they're in so good with God, you say, you tell God because you have this in with him. You tell him that he needs to come and tell me directly. There's the message. You want to make this more simple? Build on the rock, not sinking sand. Choose by faith the rock of ages. Choose by faith the one who said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Choose by faith there. And say, I need to wait and see how this thing's going. Well, there'll be other chances. There'll be other times. But today, and I love this about this word, today, if you'll hear his voice and harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation, today, 
when you start today beginning to choose by faith, the opportunities abound. And I'm just saying, let faith loose, turn it loose, quit being this perpetual, I got to figure out if this is safe enough for me to do. I'll leave you with my one last crazy story because I've told it to you enough times that it really does define some of the people who can never just walk by faith. I told you I went to summer camp and told the story about having one foot in canoe and one foot on the dock. And they're busy, come on, get in the canoe, ah, right? What do you think happened? Because I couldn't make a decision because everything was st starting to go like that. And the legs were getting further and further apart. Of course, all the people that were in the canoe were in the water. So I should have made a choice there. But instead, I chose thinking that keeping one foot there and one foot there would be safe, and it's not. And that's the rest of our life as, as a faithing community. By faith. Choose by faith. So I hope that there'll be a lot of faith choices and a lot of faith opportunities. And out of this message, recognize Moses is chronicled here for us to be able to glean, not just to chronicle his life as a history in the redemption of humankind and the giving of the law, but chronicled for us to really take hold of things sometimes that are given to us through this book that must be appropriated by faith, and then we choose to walk by faith. And that is, that's what's going to take you all the way home from faith to faith. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.